Well, thank you guys for being here. My name is Zach Hurley. I'm the CEO and co-founder of IndieSource. You probably, or hopefully have been on other webinars. We help fashion entrepreneurs to build successful fashion companies. Our primary way of doing that is through product development and manufacturing. We produce right here in Los Angeles. So welcome, if you're in LA, we would love for you to come by and visit us. And the reason that I'm doing these webinars and that I continue to put out this content is because well, a couple of reasons. The number one reason is because I want to make sure that the people that come in here that we make stuff for actually come back and thrive and are happy and live the lives that they want. It can actually create the dreams that they're thinking of, right? It's about making that product. It's about actually building the life you want, creating the business that you want. And realistically, if I go and we make you guys some products and you can't sell it, I never hear from you again. And that doesn't make me very happy. So I'm very, very invested in making sure that the people here, the people that follow IndieSource are given the tools to, uh, to succeed. And I'm on a personal journey basically to figure out how we can make that happen for you. And so today I have a very special guest who is someone who I believe is, has, has done this, has done this in many ways. He has seen brands go from nothing to hundreds of millions of dollars in, in a variety of different ways. And I'm very excited to, to have him on. I know you have a lot of questions about money. It's actually the number one thing that we get asked. So, and that's not going away. So I'm super stoked to have somebody here that we can start to get some information about the financing, the money. How do I get the money? How do I grow? And we're going to dive right into it. Dana, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Zach. This is Dana Freed, and, and I'd just like to start, if you could just give everybody a little bit of a background about, about you and, and where you're coming from. Yeah, um, thank you. And first I wanna say uh, thank you to IndieSource and Zach, I appreciate you, you know, just giving me an opportunity. And, and I wanna thank all the entrepreneurs who are on the call right now because you, know, you, you, you are the ones that are in the front line. You, you're the ones that are you know, spending these long nights and, uh, and days and not sure whether or not you're going to make it or whether you're doing the right thing. And it, it takes a lot to be an entrepreneur and it's lonely at times because it takes many years sometimes to be successful at it. Uh, my background is I come from a finance operational background. I got involved in the uh, fashion industry um, through uh, a, a woman who was starting a footwear company that had been recommended, I had been recommended to her and, um, and I was her consultant in the first five years. Her name was Taryn Rose. She was an orthopedic surgeon. And through the first five years, we built the company into a multi-million dollar business. And in the sixth year, I jumped in as her COO, CFO, and we tripled the business. And I always like to think in that respect, um, you know, the two of us were dumb and dumber. We made every mistake in the book, but we learned and just through sheer will and hard work, we were able to make a successful company since then, I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs um, in all different stages of their business. In the very beginning, a couple that I've worked with, Sophia Nastigal, when she left uh, eBay, I started to mentor her and consult with her. And I was with her through the first four years of the company through the Series A. And we, it was probably the most successful portion of the company, the highest growth rate of the company. And there were probably two or three times I jumped in as her COO, CFO, helped her with the financing, helped her with the operations, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I'm still very involved with her um, as, as an advisor for Girl Boss Media. And, uh, and, and she's a very close friend. Another is Tommy John. I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but uh, it's a men's underwear company. We just launched women's a year ago. I started with Tom and his girlfriend at the time, now his wife, Erin. And, um, and I've been on his board of directors for the last 10 years. And uh, we built a, an extremely successful company that is extremely profitable. Um, and as we continue to scale, we do it without really raising money. We, we, we did a Series A about six, seven years ago, never raised another penny. And, um, and we've been able to you know, grow this thing into multi, multi millions of dollars and continue to be as profitable as possible as, as any business is. And uh, with that being said, again, Thank you all for, this is my first webinar. So if I'm not looking into the camera, you got to give me some slack there. For sure. For sure. The technology is, well, fortunately we have Zoom, so it's working. 
Um, and if you guys have any issues with the quality, just let us know. So before I dive to the beginning, which is like, I know, I know everybody wants to talk about, you were saying something kind of interesting about, about that scale of Tommy John. You know, if you had to give me one key thing that you focus on for these brands to, to, to grow and scale, is there something that, that really sticks out to you yeah. from a financial perspective? Yeah, fundamentally, the, the first thing I do with anybody that I work, because I've got about 50 clients around the world right now that I work with, and they're in all different phases of their business, some pre-launch, some doing millions of dollars in sales. Um, and what we do initially is to make sure that they have a real good idea of what their cash flow and what's coming around the corner. And so it's really about planning. And so the first thing we do with every client is we make sure that they understand, A, if they're new to the business, what they're going to be spending money on that they may not even be aware of. And then secondly, if they're in business, you know, what money's coming in, what are they planning, how are they growing, and then where's that cash going out? And so it sounds simple, because it really is to do it. It just becomes a matter of, it becomes a real planning tool because as you're growing, as you're taking into account your inventory, you're open to buy, you don't wanna to carry too much inventory at one time, it'll tie up your cash flow. So you can't build brand awareness, you can't build infrastructure. And at the same time, uh, you don't wanna to do too little inventory so that you're missing out on sales. So all of that really has to be planned as well as, as you are as a manufacturer here in LA, which I commend you greatly. And I just want to say something about IndieSource and about manufacturers that manufacture in the United States. You know, they, they've done research and Consumer Reports says that by manufacturing in the United States, 60 to 80 percent of consumers are willing to pay 10 percent more. So that's a feature and benefit that I think is really important to understand because you know, when you're doing manufacturing in the United States, especially in LA, there are certain minimum wage laws that we have to pay that aren't being done, you know, outside of this country or yeah. in other states. Right. Um, so I just wanted to say that for, for Zach's um, sense. But uh, I, I would say that planning financially, you really have to understand what's going on. You really have to look at things six to 12 months out because you have to understand with what you're doing now and the decisions that you're making day to day today, how is that going to impact you and your ability to grow and your ability to build brand awareness and your ability to do what's necessary to build value. So it sounds like you said it all, it stems from cash flow, right? That that's mm -hmm. a core pillar of, of building it out properly. And then from there, you're, you're saying like, well, how do I appropriate the money? Right. It starts with how much, Right, and so one of the, uh, the biggest questions that everybody asks is, well, how much money do I need? And, but you're saying, well, it's a flow, right? Correct. So how, first of all, how do you determine a good, how do you determine how much money you need before you can even decide where to put it? Uh, well, the first thing is, is you have to get your ducks in a row from a financing standpoint. Where are you coming up with the cash flow to start a business? And I, I can't tell you how many times people will come to me, they're going to want to hire me, and they have so little money to begin. They don't have the money to do design and development. They don't have the money to go into production. They don't have the money to do art direction. They don't have the money to build a website. They don't have the money to market a website. If you can't do these things, I always tell people, you know, take a job in the industry, get to know what needs to be done before taking that type of, you know, commitment on finding out that you're going to run out of cash, which is the absolute worst time is once you begin and realize you don't have enough and maybe you haven't reached milestones that you were hoping to reach to show that you have a viable product, that people love, love it, that your customers are coming back. Um, and, and if that's the case, then what ends up happening is, you know, you, you wasted a lot of time, energy, effort, and more importantly, the money that you had saved to begin this thing. So what the cash flow does is it looks at based on the type of product it is. If you're a luxury item, it's going to be a hell of a lot different than if you're fast fashion, you know. And so we always start with the end in mind. And to start with that, we look at who are we competing with, okay? Um, where are we selling this? Who is our customer? And so there's a lot of research that's done up front to determine what are our features and benefits with who we're competing with, what type of componentry do we need to use? What is the construction going to be like? How are we going to communicate our brand differential or our, our, our brand value proposition? 
And in starting this, we also have to understand what is the MSRP that we can sell this for? Because a lot of times with people that are starting companies, they will create a product and they'll say, well, I'm going to mark it up four times or I'm going to mark it up five times. And that's not how you do it. You've got to understand who you're competing with, what, how you're different, how you're going to communicate that, and then work backwards to ensure that you have enough margin to grow your business with. Because um, without margin, you won't be able to build infrastructure. You won't be able to advertise, brand, market, selling, you know, fulfillment, you know, you name it. Um, it, it just isn't going to happen. And so with, with the cash flow, it really gives you an idea of specifically, if this is what I'm going to do, working backwards, how much do I have to make this for? What are my minimum order quantities going to be? And that's where somebody like you comes in. And I know that we've been talking about this in the past as well. A lot of times, you know, I'll have clients will look at a product that's very much like the product they're going to develop with some changes to it. And I'll have them go to the manufacturer and say, could you produce this within 10% of this price point? And a lot of times they'll say, yes, we can, but our minimum is 500 units. And if they're doing a collection of 10 styles, that's 5,000 units. There's a lot of risk with that since there's no distribution. And if they don't have the capital to grow the business, and even if they do have the capital to grow the business, there's a big risk that the cost per acquisition of customers in order to sell this inventory can, you know, just burn through their cash rather quickly. So yeah. again, back to the planning phase, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So do you recommend, I mean, I think this is a, a question that a lot of people here are having, which is, um, in the beginning, do I just make less and, and really take a hit on the margin to test my proof of concept to make sure that I can validate that people want this? Or do I really focus on the margin, produce the 500 units uh, or 1,000 units and get, it, get that down so they have a, a lot of space? I mean, what's the, what's the general? No, that's advice? a great question. And, and it's always produce less to figure out, because usually 80% of your, your collection is going to generate, uh, you know, or 20% of your collection is going to generate 80% of your sales. So if you're doing 10 units, two of them are going to be your, your, your stars and the other eight. So if you're doing 500 or a thousand and you do a $10,000 production or 10,000 unit production run in order to have margins that are five times from cost to MSRP, what will happen is because you can't distribute it, all of your cash flow gets tied up in your inventory and it gathers dust. And right. your inventory turns could be two or three years, or you can have months and months, 11, 12, 15 months on hand based on our projected forecast of sales. But what ends up happening is you have to discount it. And as you're discounting it to get rid of it or giving it away or never selling it, then at that point, what ends up happening is the margins that you were shooting for disappear completely. So I always look at it as it's always a margin cash sort of decision. And so a lot of my clients, as they're working with this, will determine if we were to run 500 units or 300 units as our minimum order quantity, what is the price per unit to get this done? Whether full package cut and so it doesn't matter. What is our price? And then at that point, we'll go back and say, if you can do 50 to 100, we're taking a much less risk on cash flow by doing a much less inventory uh, production run. But at the same time, it's going to tell us, hey, which styles are working? Or do we have a product that's viable? Are customers coming back? And what ends up happening is even if your margins go from five to one to two to one, you're still spending so much less in cash to determine exactly what works and what doesn't. And I think that that is, especially in the beginning, and I don't care whether you have millions of dollars to launch, because the key is, is you want to make sure that you are running it as efficiently as possible. Because as you grow from, you know, 100,000 to a million, from a million to 10 million, 10 million to 100 million, you need that cash flow. Right. And you don't want to waste it by doing things that don't make any sense or eat up your margins anyways. And that's yeah. what investors are looking for as well. Right. It's, it gives you an opportunity to, uh, to gain some traction. Now, it's not going to be um, uh, like at scale. You're not going to have tons of data, but you will be able to say on this, on these small quantity, this is what sold through. Here's what didn't do well. Right. And, uh, and I also want to speak to you know, people are going to ask me, well, IndieSource, you guys have a MOQ of 300. Here's the thing. Um, the reason I set it there 
it's not uh, it's not hard and fast. Like there there are people that will do less for, but but I'll tell you why all manufacturers set their set their MOQs. The reason that they often do that is because they have had enough experiences talking with other brands where when they say I'll do it for less, but this is the brand says no, right? So again, if you, I think it's a switch in mentality where you were the two key things I heard from that. Number one, instead of asking how much it costs, you figure out how much you, you want to make it for, right? And then you go to the manufacturer with that number based off of your business and your situation. Number two is the realization that MOQs only exist because of so, like certain variables within the manufacturing. So for us, look, the reality is we have a fixed cost to run any production. We have a fixed cost. There are certain things that I have to do no matter what. And that means if I'm dividing that cost across 50 units versus 500, the price point per unit is going to go up dramatically, right? I don't want to, you know, the, it's not like I want to charge a lot. It's that to do all of the processes at 50 units, the cost is higher. So now you have a key opportunity in decision making, which is, all right, we can do less. We can do sample runs and we can do this and that. But it is a, it is more of a market research tool, marketing tool, uh, a test uh, of validating your proof of concept rather than a uh, scaling out the business. Correct. And so the people that I see do well are the ones that don't get, because it's a very psychological thing. Don't you agree? I, mean, it's a, I think sometimes people get so worked up that they don't have the right, um, the right margins and they don't have enough cash. And so they don't do anything. Right. And so what's a better opportunity is just like CJ just said, focus on quality, focus on making the product real tight and then do a run where maybe you don't have the best margins, but you start to get data and you start to get information. You start to like get feedback and now you can make an, a, a smarter decision. And it sounds like people also will, uh, there's a potential to get some, some funding. And so I actually want to ask you a question about that because a lot of people have questions when you're just getting started. If you have no sales history, it's like impossible to get a bank or uh, anybody to like give you any money. Like, What's your advice on how brands that are new can can raise funds uh, to get their business going? You know, and at what point do they does it? When what's too early, and then what's the right time to to reach out for some capital? You know, well, I think from an investor standpoint, a lot of investors are looking at you know, um, a is the product viable? B, you know, the, the lifetime value of their customers are they coming back? Do they have margins? Um, that plays a huge role because on the margin side, if you don't have margin as you're launching your business, then you have no money to grow the business. And investors are looking at this and they're saying, if there's no margins, I'm going to have to keep putting money in, in order because the margins are what we're using to market, you know, whether it's digitally and somebody had asked the question, what's DTC? It's direct to consumer. It's, it's online. Um, you know, you, you, you just don't have the, you know, the, the funding to reinvest back in the business. And so um, when, when, I look at, when I look at somebody, you know, once you have, let's say, if you're selling online and you've got higher margins because you're selling online as opposed to wholesale, that's fantastic. Um, but there's a cost to that as well. If you're selling wholesale, you have uh, customers that have great credit um, you know, and aren't in trouble as a retailer, then there's a number of ways to do it. You can do PO financing, you can do factoring. Um, and, and what that means is somebody will lend you the money if you pick up a PO from Nordstrom's. Um, a, a, a finance company will, once you ship it to Nordstrom's, they'll advance you that money before Nordstrom's pays because Nordstrom pays in 45 days. Um, but even before that, if you have a factory that's going to make it, they'll put the money up in the factory to enable you to make it as well. And they sort of do, you know, there's intercreditor agreements. There's a number of things that could be done. Now most of them do it themselves, um, both PO financing and factory. That's a way to do it. If, if you own certain intellectual property and you've got a patent on it, that may be something that's interesting. And I'm not talking about a design patent, but I'm talking about something that may be a little bit different in the marketplace. Like at Tommy John, we came up with a, a dress shirt that doesn't come untucked. 
okay? And we have certain patents on some of our clothing, which we're still trying to figure out how to, how to um, maximize its value. But with all that being said, um, you know, right now at this point in time, I, I would recommend if you're starting, and I, I'm saying this because most of the participants are pre-launch or just launch, you need to show that your business is growing. You need to show that your business has margin. You need to show that you are operationally efficient because investors are looking at two things, sales and growth of sales, and they're looking at EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's the cash flow that a business gives off. In the beginning, it's really difficult because you don't really have the data there and you're still growing the business. But I think the days where investors are throwing money at an idea in the apparel industry is it, it, it's, it's far and you know, it just doesn't happen as much anymore. So what you need to do is you need to plan, A, do I have friends and family that love me and are willing to give me money if I need it? B, I need to put a cash flow together and I need to be aware of every single expense I have coming up, especially if you don't have, if you don't have the experience. You know, you have no idea that not only will I have to pay for the development of my product, um, but once the product's developed, I have to do art direction. You know, I have to take photography. I have to build a website. You know, all these things cost money as you're doing it. And now, once my website's up, before then, I've got to go into production. So I have to have product to sell. Or I've got to have samples that I can use with a showroom who's going to go out there and try to pick POs up for uh, retailers so that we could also build brand awareness that way. Once you understand all the steps, then it gives you a really good idea of, okay, I need 50,000. I need 100,000. If you're doing luxury products, I have clients of mine that manufacture in Italy, um, doing footwear or doing handbags. You know, now all of a sudden we're dealing with uh, Euro uh, in, in currency exchanges and things like that. So the key to, to what you need to do first is you really need to educate yourself just to ensure, A, you understand your product line, you understand where the MSRPs need to be, you understand how you're going to make yourself different, like I mentioned before, and then working backwards with somebody like IndieSource or a manufacturer who's going to be able to say, yes, I can do it for this or not, but instead of doing my MOQ of 300 or 500, we'll do a smaller one. You're not going to make much money on it, but we're going to make the determination of what sells and what doesn't. And based on what doesn't sell, you need to get rid of that anyways, but you're not taking such a huge position on inventory to take that kind of risk. It's different if you're an established company because you already know what sells. Whether you're doing a new product line or something like that, you already have the relationship with the manufacturers. You already have lines going on a constant basis. So it's a little bit, it's a lot different at that point. So it's yes. a struggle at first. No, absolutely. And I think that's a good point with just like figuring out where you can get the money in the beginning. Because again, you're not going to get it from the investors in the beginning or the banks in the beginning. Um, find who can support you. Uh, make sure you're, you're if, you, if you are working uh, a full-time job, I know a lot of these people are working a nine to five. They're working for another corporation. Um, obviously, if you can have a be working for a company where you can learn some of this, that's amazing. Otherwise, start to pull money out and save up for for this type of thing as well. Um, and, but I also just want to just ask one more question because we do have a, a, a handful of people that are already kind of in growth phase. Is there a number or how, like, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, well, how do they know when they have enough data to actually go to a bank or an investor? Uh, is there a certain benchmark that they can look at? Uh, it, it, you know, if, no, if they're already selling, if they're, you know, if, if uh, you know, they're getting a huge return on ad spend, if they're doing it digitally, if they're growing their uh, sell through and uh, the number of retailers carrying their product, you know, again, I'm a huge fan of building a business right from the start and doing it profitably. Um, I'm a huge fan of not raising money. Um, because I think the longer you can go, you know, your business is worth a lot more down the line than it is in the beginning. And the money that you raise in the beginning, you know, there's a lot more risk involved from an investor standpoint. So they're going to want a bigger piece of it. And, um, and what ends up happening is you continue to grow, you know, your production con continues to grow, your infrastructure continues to grow, and you're going to need cash 
as you're bringing, bringing in more orders or you're selling more on a monthly basis. Yeah. You know, and, and so when, when you take all that into consideration, I just think that uh, to me, I'm working with a number of clients right now who came to me initially that said, I want to raise money. And I said, let's, let's not raise money first. Let's make sure that the economics of the business work. And then instead of growing it super fast, let's grow it a little, little, little bit slower, but let's control it. And yeah. let's look really attractive so that when investors come to us, we really don't need their money, which is only going to want to make them like a nasty gal. When we did a series A, our margins were through the roof. Our inventory turns were incredible. Um, you know, we were growing the infrastructure so that we, we had a, a pretty high EBITDA um, in the business. And so investors were throwing money at us. There were no decks that we had to put together. People were begging to give you money. Um, and, and so when you run a business like that, you're a lot more attractive, but more importantly, as the entrepreneur, you control the decision-making. You get to do what you want to do. You guys are the ones that are putting, you know, you're putting it all at risk. You know, you're the ones that are, 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 are taking all of this chance, you know, and, and hopefully it will work, but it may not. And you're putting your blood, sweat, and tears. You're working at night as you have a job during the day. I mean, my God, it's... You know, my, like I said, I, I, I respect what you do um, because it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of fortitude and a lot of passion. And so when I see something like that, I always say, let's be smart about it. You know, let's look at what we're going to need. Let's make sure that we do have margins. Let's make sure that we are controlling our inventory. Let's make sure that we're spending every dollar that we spend to get a high return on investment. Because A, it's going to make you look extremely attractive to investors, but B, it's going to help you run a profitable company from the beginning so you don't have to raise money. And to me, that's the, if, if you can hold on for as long as you want until you exit, and the strategy from the very beginning is how do I build value in my company, yeah. and you use those principles of laying the foundation um, then as you grow over a period of time, my God, you know, I've been involved with, with a number of people now who struggled and didn't have two cents to rub together that became extremely wealthy um, because they followed that advice. Mm -hmm. And I would advise everyone to do the same. If you don't have the money to do it, don't do it yet. But you have to understand what you need the money for, where the money is going to go. And then at that point, make the decision. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's really, really good advice and lots of good feedback here in the, in the chat. Um, I, I do want to bring up one thing before we move on to the marketing questions. Uh, a lot of people are interested in crowdfunding um, or ec crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, Kickstarters, things like that. Uh, do you have any experience with that or any advice? Yeah, I for do. I've had a lot of, I've had clients do it. Um, quite a bit as a matter of fact and you know it's it's if they're in a situation where that's the only thing they can do at this point uh, one of the things to think about is once you raise that money you better make sure you understand all of your costs and you better make sure that you have your supply chain down and you better make sure that you can deliver Absolutely. And, uh, and, and that's a biggie and let me let me just speak to that really quickly because sometimes I'll have people come to us who have already launched a Kickstarter and they're coming to me, the manufacturer now saying, Hey, we need help. Right. That's way too late. Way so too late. <clears throat> way too late. So the, the advice that I would give here is well, before you do your Kickstarter, you should know who, who's going to be producing it for you. So for example, are the ones doing uh, your, your product development, and your samples. Mm -hmm. We need to know when you're planning on launching your Kickstarter. Because the cool part is that we can help you get those pieces set up. Sometimes what a lot of um, what happens is that you'll get samples. Now, one of the differences between a lot of other manufacturers and us that I continually talk about is that other people outside of here will give you samples. We give you the whole foundation to launch the business. So what does that mean? When you are ready to launch your Kickstarter, you need to have a clarity on everything, including the markers, the grading, the material, where it's coming from, when it's going to get here. Uh, I, I, I order actually, quantities on the material. And you're the order quantities on the material, quantity. right? Basically have a plan in place for different volumes that you will produce based off of the set success of the Kickstarter. Okay. 
And so um, I just did a video about this, but what do you need to actually enter production? Well, it's not samples. Here's what you need. You need to have all your material. You need to have finished markers based off of the quantity you're producing because that's how we make markers. And then we need to have finished approved samples, not, oh, I'm going to change this and change that and da, 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 da. Because what happens is you'll finish your Kickstarter, then you'll go back to make those changes and you won't even get to enter production for a couple more weeks. So the goal in running a successful Kickstarter um, uh, program is number one, communicating with the manufacturer what's happening and making sure that the second that thing closes, we're going into production. Because the people on the other side, they, like they don't, care. they don't know that you're not done your product. So I know this is a bit of a manufacturing thing, but it really, really is important because oftentimes that part needs to be set up. You have to figure out what you're going to be producing at, vo at different volumes. And then I also do recommend, here's another mistake I see, people producing the exact amount that they pre-sold. That's a terrible idea. You have an amazing opportunity. If you just pre-sold 300 units, you need to make extra. <laughs> you don't have to make a ton extra, but you need to make some extra. It's you, it's actually one of the great strategies in wholesaling where because you're able to get purchase orders before you produce it, what you do is you take all the POs you got, you batch them together, you look at the quantity, and you add some on top, right, for reorders and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, and, and you basically, it's paid for because you have a margin from the stuff you've pre-sold. So don't forget to add a little bit for inventory uh, when you're doing your Kickstarter. So that's, yeah, I just want to... And so just to add to that, you know, and I, a great story is um, I received a phone call from somebody in another part of the country and they were saying, hey, I need your help. And I said, what do you need the help for? And they said, you know, we're doing a quick uh, Kickstarter campaign and uh, we just raised $300,000. And I said, fantastic. Are you going into production now? And the response was, we don't have any production. So it was such an elaborate Kickstarter campaign and it looked amazing and it really pulled on the heartstrings and I thought based on the video they already had everything done unfortunately they did not and it was a complete disaster and, and so again just uh, piggybacking off of what Zach just said you know you really have to have everything understood ahead of time on how you're going to deliver otherwise it's not going to be successful yeah and people are and I'm an optimistic just... guy yeah for sure. So let me switch gears a little bit to, to the marketing because it's such a huge important part of this whole thing, not just spending money on your cost of goods, but also getting in front of people. Um, is there a certain amount, uh, it could be a percentage of net sales or a certain budget or uh, that you would put into marketing? How do you reconcile that? How do you figure out what needs to go into marketing dollar yeah, wise? Again, it depends on the distribution model. Um, because it's, it's all different. You know, I've, I've worked where we've built, uh, we partnered with a group out of Milan, Italy, and we were selling the Barneys uh, high-end leather goods. And uh, we, we ended up uh, building a store at Two Rodeo. And it's, a complete, it's completely different than if you're doing a small production run and you're selling online. Um, and so when you're selling online, we always look at it as what, when we're doing a test, uh, we always want a return on ad spend of at least two, two and a half to one is the goal while we're testing. We'll look at 180, 250 variables of, uh, of different ad content or who we're, um, who we're marketing to, to see where we're getting the best results. Um, as far as a specific dollar amount, that's really difficult to say. You know, I have clients of mine that sell to retailers all over the country and, and they're spending a lot of money in merchandising. So for example, at Taryn Rose, that footwear company, when I was running that with Taryn, you know, we were doing millions at Neiman's and Nordstrom's and Saks and a number of, you know, we had our own stores and I had merchandisers going throughout the country doing, uh, doing uh, trainings for sales associates. So there was a lot of travel expenses, um, you know, doing uh, sales contests. So there was payments to people that were selling product and it worked amazingly because you know, we were the number one selling shoe in Neiman Marcus nationwide, number two at Nordstrom Salon. But that's a different kind of expense than, for example, if you're just selling online or if yeah. you are doing brick and mortar. So it's not a one size fits all for everyone. It's just a difficult percentage. I guess the, the key is if your margins are high enough, okay, then what that does is it gives you a little bit of leeway when you're spending. 
on ad spend. So, you know, if, you're, if your margins are 60 or 70%, you can spend 20% on, on ad spend, depending upon the cost per acquisition of a customer, the lifetime value of that customer. But if your margins are 30%, you know, you're probably not going to be able to spend much at all. You're going to have to do a lot of guerrilla marketing. So it really yeah. depends. Everything is really in, on an individual basis. Yeah. So, to tell, I mean, how, how do people go about that in the beginning, though? How, what, what, what can they do early on to determine, um, you know, their, their, their acquisition, to determine, to, to get that initial feedback on their direct-to-consumer site? Let's assume that they're, they're selling online because I know the majority of people here are going to be selling online. Yeah. So yeah. what... Um, how, how do you determine uh, like a return on ad spend? Like, what do you look at? You know, we're looking at, you know, specifically how much we're spending and, you know, how much it's costing to, to uh, pick up a customer. And, you know, the goal is, is that we're bringing in a lot more than we're actually spending on ad spend and that we can actually um, see the results as opposed to, you know, taking it from a third party or something like that. For example, if you're spending on Facebook, you're going to be able to see exactly what that return on ad spend, what worked and what didn't. And the yeah. key to the beginning is testing, but testing with a small dollar amount. I've worked with a lot of marketers that would spend a hell of a lot of money in engagement. And when you're starting out, if you're starting out and cash is an issue, you want to be able to make money right away. You don't want to engage and you know, have a lot of discussions about your product in the short term because it may cost you a lot of money to do that. I'm just talking about people that don't have the money to yeah. really engage. I'm talking about if you're going to spend $2,000, the goal is if you're getting a two and a half or three, three to one return on ad spend, what we do with our clients is we say, if the inventory exists, spend, keep spending. And as we keep spending, you know, the results that we've been seeing have been astronomical um, to begin with. Um, and, and then from there, you know, you can start breaking down from a, a, a digital marketing standpoint, you know, what different areas you want to get into, um, whether it's, you know, Facebook and Instagram, whether it's Pinterest, whether it's influence, I mean, there's a million different ways to go. It's just really understanding what's giving you the, in the beginning, the highest return on that ad spend. And as you continue to spend, if it starts dropping, you stop and you figure out another way to spend your money to boost right. that up again. So would you agree yeah, with this, you know, The money will be there. Yeah, would you, would you agree it. in terms of if you're, if you're just getting started, there's, there's so many different places to spend your, your marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I often talk to people, they say, well, you know, I, I, I hear I have to do SEO and then I have to do this and all these other things. But um, I mean, my feeling when you're just getting started has always been follow the place where it's, the cheapest to get the most immediate um, uh, cash, right? And so it seems to me like right now, especially for a lot of these brands who <clears throat> are not, um, they're not necessarily products that are going to be searchable. Um, they're building brands mm -hmm. that Facebook and Instagram are just the best way and the cheapest way to, to start to generate some revenue. Is Correct. that... Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say we do that, but it's interesting because you know we we're doing digital marketing for quite a few different businesses, and the results have been astounding. And with that being said, they'll say you know we'll have a client of ours, and the client will say, "Well, we do really good with Instagram, so we want to we want to do Instagram." And we say, "Hey, look, it we have no ego as to um, what we want to use. The numbers are going to tell us whatever's right. giving us the biggest return on ad spend. Somebody said, any thoughts on Pinterest? You know, one of my, on my team, I've got one of the top Pinterest um, advertisers and he's probably spent 15 million on Pinterest for a, a, a number of companies. And, um, and, and again, it's Pinterest takes a little bit more time to set up. So it's a little bit more expensive to get started than when you're doing Facebook and Instagram. But you know, not everyone's going to do well with Pinterest, while some companies that um, may do much better with Pinterest than they'll do with Facebook or Instagram. It just depends. Again, it's not a, and, and I'm not trying to evade the question at all. It's just not a one size fits all. But I will say one thing. If you know nothing about digital marketing and you think that you're going to go in there and do really, be really successful and you have a limited amount of money to run your company month to month, my advice is, Hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay, do it month to month. So when you're doing a month to month, let them perform. Make right. sure that you're getting that return on ad spend. Um, don't get in any long-term contracts. 
there's a lot of people I've worked with over a long period of time before the team I've been working with now for the last six months. And um, in some of these people have had massive success with large companies, but not so, not so much with the type of audience that we have here today. And yeah. so, uh, you know, again, every dollar you're spending, you want to make sure that you're learning something from it. You want to make sure it's coming back as a return. And then once you have that customer, you may have paid to get them and maybe you broke even to get them the first time, but now you're marketing to them over and over and over again. And if there's a lifetime value where they're coming back and buying product over and over and over, you're not spending dollars to get them in the future. And that's the beauty of, you know, doing the whole direct to consumer. You've got them, you've got them, you, you have the information, you're, re, you're retargeting and, and promoting, and continue, you know, trying to drive that. Um, I, I actually have a question I just thought about because this has come up a, a bunch and it's, it's, it's sort of a marketing question, but more of a merchandising question, mm-hmm. um, which I'll throw at you, <laughs> which is, um, you know, sometimes people want to start small, right? And that's okay. And so I often get asked, well, well, how many pieces do I need to start with? Because obviously, financially, the more pieces you have, the better chance of selling more and having your cart value be higher, right? Mm-hmm. Math wise. Is there any sort of advice you can give uh, the folks here so that, you know, who are just trying to, they want to start small, but you know, it's kind of hard to build a direct to consumer brand with one product sitting on a website. Right. But I agree with that. One of the things you want to do is again, when you're looking at your competition, a lot of times what I'll tell clients to do is they're, if, if they're in the pre-launch state is, you know, who's your customer? You know, hey, I want to sell at Nordstrom's. What department in Nordstrom's? And take a look at who's selling in that department. Take a look at what they have in that department. If you're starting out, I would not want to start with a huge collection, but you want to have enough where you can merchandise it. You want to have enough where, you know, think about it at a retail location. If you walk in, if it's a top with a bottom or if it's a dress without with a jacket. And again, I'm not a merchandiser, so... I'm sure a lot of you designers are laughing at me right now and for good reason. But but the point is, is that you can't go out. A a perfect example of this would be a company that I met at a show. They wanted me to come out and this guy was a manufacturer in China. So he met me in Riverside and, um, and we took a look at um, what they were doing in development and they had hundreds of styles. And I was asking them, you're not going into production with all these styles. And he goes, yes, I have. And I go, well, how many units of inventory do we have back there? It's like 40,000 units. And I go, well, how many units are we selling on a monthly basis? About 400. And I'm thinking, you know, you got 100 years. I forgot what it was, but it was like, you know, you probably have based on your, on your forecasted sales, probably 50 years of inventory. I mean, it's just insane to do something like that. So when you're merchandising, most of the time, I'll tell uh, clients, why don't you start with anywhere from eight to 10 pieces, do that smaller production run, find out of those eight to 10 pieces, which ones are selling, get rid of the ones that aren't, and then build the collection around, you know, the stars of your, you know, initial collection that you, you launch. Um, and a good so you do have the merchant. Just to, just to piggyback onto that, just for, again, another thing that like another light bulb from a manufacturing perspective is this. When you produce more styles all at once, it is also easier for the manufacturer to do less. And one of the reasons is if you're smart, a a very smart merchandising tip is you want to leverage similar fabrics across styles, right? So whether you're doing, if you're doing athletic wear, we take the same type of, it's the poly spandex or nylon, and you want to use that across styles. Why? Number one, it allows us to have to be able to buy more fabric and not get stuck with surcharges and all sorts of things when we're, when we're ordering materials. But also is that the manufacturing process is easier because the total order, even though the quantities per style are going to be less, right? I, I'm much more likely to take, you know, a 200 unit order, or 150 unit order if they're in styles than if there's just one, right? Because it's just really hard to do, you know, it's just a lot of work. But, but if there's more styles, you will use fabric across those styles. Uh, and then the customer also will just have more to choose from, increasing the likelihood that they spend more on the website. Do you see how all these things start to connect yep. from the merchandising per, uh, and, and then ultimately landing in your, in your cart and, and people buying more? 
Um, right. It's an so important yeah, KBI. We're looking at average order value. You know, we don't want it too small. We're looking at the, you know units per transaction. I mean, all these things are extremely important in determining how profitable you're going to be. Because if you're doing small little orders all the time, you know, you're also paying out a fulfillment potentially. You're doing it yourself in the beginning, and it becomes a, a massive time suck. Yeah. You're trying to run your company. It's huge. It's huge. And and you, you said one other thing also that, that I think is important before about, um, which I just want to touch back on this in the very beginning, everyone's, we're all on this process where we're trying to figure out who am I, what, who is my customer? Um, and, and I think one of the things that is a problem uh, sometimes is comparing yourself to, to giant companies um, or companies that are so much bigger than you being very broad i mean what what are, what are some things that you've seen um in terms of if you're just trying to get started right i mean like how focused should they be how focused when how you're focused talking about your competition should, yeah when the designers are, are getting started how focused should their line be in terms of determining like their target customer um because let me put it let me put it this way a lot of calls we get it's like i'm i'm uh, i'm targeting a woman from 20 to 60 and she's this and, and the, it seems very broad. So how targeted do we need to be? Well, you know, obviously you, you want to understand, you know, everything you can about your customer and, and, and that doesn't go away. But you also want to know in the beginning, you know, what makes you different in the marketplace and how are you going to communicate that difference? And you have to be able to do that because I've had people come to me and when they're doing their research, I look at it and I look at their features and benefits. I look at their price points. I look at their materials. And it's like, you're not going to be able to compete with the, with the companies that are out there spending millions of dollars on branding and marketing or hundreds of millions of dollars. People are not going to buy your product because they're, you're not differentiated enough. enough. The beautiful part is they can put their own spin on it. I mean, of the 67 participants, a lot of them are designers or a lot of them are extremely creative. You know, the only reason I want them to look at the competitors is I want them to have an idea. I don't want them to do something so avant-garde. It's going to be a waste of time. No one's going to buy it. And I see right. that a lot in design school, Got it. you know, but I want them to understand, am I on the right track? You know, and I always want them to put their consumer hat on. So a lot of times um, the designers or the entrepreneur, I'll always ask them, as a consumer, would you buy this? As a consumer, what does this mean? As a consumer, do you understand what you're saying? So if they say high quality, that's one of my features. And, and what's the benefit to the customer? What about that quality? What about the fabric is different? You know, and what's great about um, Tom, our CEO at Tommy John, who's uh, just a, a dear, dear friend, and, and, and I respect him so much as a merchandiser and as, a, as somebody that's developed this product, is, you know, if you look at the website, you'll see fit and function and what it does and is it more breathable? Does it solve a problem? And there's always something that we're doing that is going to um, make the consumer's life easier. And at the same time, they're going to get it. So when you hear a feature in the benefit, a lot of times the benefit isn't to the consumer. It's just well, it's high quality. Well, what the hell does that mean, high quality? You know, quality to me is probably different than quality to Bill Gates. Right. You know, you can only imagine. And so be more specific. And then you, looking at your competition and understanding what they're doing, do you have something different? Do you truly do? Maybe you'll see something with, with what the competition's doing and you'll add it to your product. But you've got to be different, not completely different. You're not reinventing the wheel. But at the same time, if you can't communicate your features and benefits, or what makes you different in the marketplace, your competitive advantage, then how's anyone going to understand it at retail? How's anyone going to come to your website when you have minimal dollars to spend? And right. so that becomes really important. Um, Love it. And bringing it back again, bringing it back again to manufacturing, you're going to have fabrics that might have certain features. Mm -hmm. Now the feature may be, oh, it's antimicrobial. Okay. Well, that's right. not a benefit that we don't, that's a feature. So what does that actually mean? What does the feature of the fabric mean? Does it mean it will be more breathable and they will sweat less and they will maybe, you know, date more or something, right? right. I mean, like whatever your angle is, because they're not staking up the place, like a benefit has to come into reality as something that makes their life better and is tangible. And now it becomes emotional and then they can go and the, the $4 increase 
doesn't seem that bad because they don't want to smell anymore, it, right? It, it's like, for example, it, you know, with Tommy John, you know, 10 years ago, we got into a test order at Neiman Marcus and we got into 15 doors. Tom went out and he did trunk shows, but we put together four by six cards that would talk about these features and benefits. And we'd get people to try the undershirt on at that point. And 90% of the time they would buy it. When Tom was doing these trunk shows at these 15 different um, Neiman's, we set a record as the fastest company in history to get into all doors. And wow. then we went to Nordstrom's and at Nordstrom's, we went into 120 doors within nine months. And Nordstrom's is a multi-million dollar business for us 10 years later, but it really yeah. was the company because we talked yeah. about those features and benefits. Got it. So you really just focus on the differentiation of the product. Yes. They got it. And so then they placed you in those, those, those yes. big stores. Because we sold through because, because we were training the sales associates at the floor level to truly understand what made our product different. Because if, if, if you don't have some type of video playing, and we certainly couldn't afford to do it back then, um, or something that tells you what your product does, somebody walking down an aisle isn't going to be able to tell us from any other underwear company at the time that was out there. So it became really important from a training, which is what we also did at Taryn Rose with yeah. our merchandisers. And right. I do with a number of my clients today. Huge, huge. So we have, uh, we have about uh, five or six more minutes left. We're going to jump into some Q&A right now. But before we do that, I just want to give you guys a little bit of uh, like next steps and what you can do. So when we get off of this call, because I appreciate you being here so much, Dana, I don't want to bombard you. So, so here's, here's if, if you are in a place in your business where you're really, really ready to take it to the next level and you feel like you need some support from Dana and his firm. And I just want to mention something really quickly because we've been talking about marketing. So although he is an expert at all of this finance stuff and cash flow and making sure that the structurally his company and mine have partnered and he also does tremendous advertising. So we talked about the actual marketing, but I, I cause somebody had also chatted, well, who, who can do this? He can do this and his team is great. And so if you're interested and serious, serious about working with Dana, it could be uh, uh, more on a consulting level for financial, or it could be for actually having his team run your advertising for you. Um, then here's, I'm going to have Natalie put my Calendly link into the chat and you can schedule three to five minutes with me. I want to make sure that this is something you're really serious about. And then what I'll do is I'll schedule some time uh, or make the connection to Dana um, after that conversation if I feel that it's a good fit. Uh, I just don't want to bombard him right now. But if this is something that makes sense for you guys, please let us know. Uh, grab five minutes on my calendar and then we will connect you directly to Dana and his team. So. All right, so here are some of the, uh, yeah, so Natalie just posted in there, it's my Calendly. No scheduling tomorrow, I'm out of town, but starting next week, you're all good. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, here we go, let's, a couple questions. Uh, with a small budget, but knowing a few local boutiques, high-end stores willing to sell your product, uh, what would be your suggestion as far as budget? So, you, uh, so this is from Sophia, and I, I'm just trying to, are you talking about, um, budget to sell the products is this like all right go ahead and and shoot me a like a response to that because i guess i'm not 100 percent clear what's a good target margin uh we have a, an attendee asking is there a target margin um in wholesale or overall let's just say uh, let's say direct consumer uh direct consumer look at i I'm, I'm always shooting and i know you and i've talked about this and we smile when, when we do um because you know, there, what I always try to do is I always try to shoot for um, a five times markup from it, it, from cost, landed cost, making sure that it's being um, calculated correctly to MSRP. And if you yep. do that, you know, then if you're selling wholesale, if you're building your business that way to begin with, you're still going to get, you know, a little bit over 50, anywhere from 45 to 55% at wholesale and direct the consumer, you know, hopefully after chargebacks, markdowns, first time, buy more, save more, whatever strategy you have, the goal is, is can you have margins between 50 and 60? I have a lot of my clients are over 60% margin because as you build your company, as you reach critical mass, your operating expenses will be 30 to 40% of your net sales. 
And if you have a 60% margin, that's giving you a 20% EBITDA. So if you're doing a million, you know, your business is 200,000 of free cash flow when it's over. And, and that's building value. So as you continue to grow, usually businesses are valued as a multiple of EBITDA or multiple of sales, depending upon the growth. But the key is, is you, you become very attractive to raising money. But the beautiful part is you don't have to do it because of the efficiencies of how you're running it. I know that isn't always possible. When we talked about it, if it's three to 500 units MOQ, the goal would be working backwards and can we do 20% of our cost between component tree and cut and sew and finishing and shipping, or if you're out of the country and freight and duty to get it landed in fulfillment or if you're working out of your house to begin with at 20% of that MSRP that you researched as opposed to just increasing it by five times and then being out of the market because your MSRP is too high and not competitive to companies that you're competing with. Um, right. exactly. So that's always the first thing because it gives you the ability to then wholesale as well without draining yourself cash flow wise. And it's, it's not easy to do, you know, jewelry, for example, I have clients of mine that their margins are 85, 90%, um, you know, initial markup or IMU. Uh, but, but overall, the, the higher the margin, the better, because in the beginning, your revenue is going to be smaller. So at, at critical mass, meaning you're, you're producing uh, with the highest MOQs, your, um, your operating expenses are 30 to 40% of your net sales. Before you hit critical mass, your operating expenses are gonna be so much higher a percentage of net sales, which means this is where the money is needed for investment into the company as you prove it, you know, your margins and your operating efficiency. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a, that's talking a bunch of, no, just kidding. <laughs> nah, they're loving it. They're loving it. Amazing feedback. And um, uh, so I think you actually answered the other question, which was what to put in terms of fabric and materials. Uh, someone else asked, where can you do your product development? Is it preferable to work with the manufacturer or do it somewhere else? <laughs> Always with the manufacturer. I mean, I've, I've had people work with sample houses. Here's the problem. You're working with a sample house. They're giving you costing on it. You go to the manufacturer, the manufacturer says, Hey, it's great that they were charging this, but we're not set up as the same type of business. So I always recommend just to cut down on out of pot or just to cut down on development costs. You always want to work a with a manufacturer and have them do the sampling because they'll cost it out for you. You'll have the MOQs. If you do less than MOQ and you get an upcharge, at least you'll know up front as opposed to having a sample house and paying them to do it and using all the material, et cetera and then having to buy more material for sampling and then give it to your manufacturer because they're more than likely going to have to do it again. Exactly. And we, and we, and by that, that's been part of the, the process here. And the reason it's so important is because we, we, while we do keep them separate, manufacturing, they have to talk to each other. So yes. day one this is where I have my team. Like day one, we building an ideal purchase order for you in the, in the beginning of development, we do that. We t day one, all right, well, what type of quantity, what are the price points we want to be at? We build out an ideal purchase order before we've even made anything. Why? Because that allows us to work towards that goal and not have any, uh, you know, surprises. And so, uh, you know, working with somebody who is also determining the price is huge. And I also want to say, like, there have been times where um, it just isn't feasible um, to hit the certain price point based off of what they're doing. And I have no problem passing you guys to somebody else that can do it in another country if they're a really good fit. And we have great relationships with other, you know, other manufacturers that we've produced overseas um, at scale. It, it, the economics have to make sense. And can so make, it really- Can I make one yeah. comment on that? And, yeah. and I want to say, I, I, when I, what really, um, what I loved about IndieSource is they are very detailed in what they do. And, and Zach hasn't asked me to say this or anything, but I brought a client to IndieSource and they went through the whole process with a client of mine that was from out of state. And I was just so impressed with how detailed they were to ensure that when they're making this sample, they're taking everything into consideration in the development process because, you know, you know, people don't realize how important the pattern is. You get your pattern wrong, you can have fit issues, returns, it can have a real negative impact on the business. I was just really impressed with IndieSource and I don't align, align myself with manufacturers. I mean, I know a lot of them, but I was just really impressed by both, both Zach and his partner 
in the detail that they had for my client. And, uh, and it made me feel like they were in really good hands. And, and that, that's really important. And I felt that they were honest and I felt that they were upfront about what it was gonna cost and they weren't trying to sell them something that they weren't gonna be able to deliver. They took everything into consideration. So again, you know, financially, if it's something that you can afford, obviously you're always working with the manufacturer. And I found that IndieSource was a company that really wanted to help, but at the same time, were really open and honest and, uh, and, and really, you know, transparent about exactly what those costs were going to be and, and again, not everyone fits everybody. Right. Um, and that's normal in any business. But, but I was just really impressed with that. I just really wanted to say that. And I know you didn't ask me to, but I thought no, it was. It's okay. No, I appreciate it. Somebody asked if we're hiring. We are hiring. And uh, <laughs> we're hiring for a variety of roles. If you're interested, you can definitely let me know. Um, if you are uh, interested in development, um, then you know we have our development cheat sheet. We have a ton of more information please follow us on, on Instagram and we're going to continue to put out free content and try to give you templates and things you can use to start to formulate the brand and the process and everything. And hopefully after this discussion, you guys have some more clarity financially as to how you can make sure you have the margins and, and start to scale that out. Again, if you're interested in speaking with Dana and his team, please book three to five minutes with me uh, and we will go from there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dana, for being here. We have- Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. And good luck. Keep kicking ass. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, brother. Bye. Bye.